Some films were harmed in the making of this podcast. From Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and the Palatial FYC Studios, you are listening to For Your Consideration. The podcast featuring roundtable discussions reevaluating the cinematic canon of past masterpieces and modern classics. I'm your host, Dustin Friesenham. And I'm your host, Mike Josek. We'd like to just give a shout out to anybody catching the show on iHeartRadio, Spotify, YouTube, where all good pods are cast. And if you're catching the show, streaming or download off of iTunes while you're there, rate and review the show. We'd appreciate it. It's been a while. We've been a little spotty this last couple of months with <laughs> Christmas and me out of town and all that fun jazz. Yeah, it has been a while. We've definitely taken our time with these last couple of episodes. But hey, we're trying and we'll get there and we're still going to keep trucking along. I honestly can't guarantee that the schedule will become more regular. <laughs> but yeah, like you said, we will keep trucking along. We do have, uh, I mean, January is our anniversary month. Uh, so on the, at the end of January, we will have kind of a anniversary extravaganza as we try to do every year I think four years it'll be four full years of the show and wow that's <laughs> <laughs> kind of surprising uh, and we've got uh, our hundredth FYC episode coming up soon spoiler alert we'll be hitting the other number one on the list <laughs> so yeah we got a few things that we kind of want to do and uh, we'll probably in that episode we'll probably kind of lay down what our plans are for 2020 and see what happens from there but coming up first as we mentioned at the end of the last episode this week was my pick and i'm going back to an old uh, poll that we had that uh this film lost and i said we'd be doing it again eventually anyway and that film is park chan wook's 2003 tragic comedy thriller revenge film revenge epic <laughs> old boy A.K.A. Socially Awkward John Wick. The man hasn't seen anybody in 15 years. He's bound to be a little a little off his rocker in his revenge. I didn't think about it at the time, but this movie... I mean, John Wick does have some old boy DNA in it, doesn't it? <laughs> a lot of these films are bound to be inspired by other films and have little pieces in them, intentional or not. Man, with this movie, you got to be careful how you phrase have a little of old boy's DNA in it. <laughs> Which is a great opportunity to just say, uh, for anybody who, who isn't familiar with the format of the show, uh, beware, spoilers ahead. So, I guess we don't really have any more preamble. Uh, I'll just do the credits of the film. We're getting clumsier. The less we do it, <laughs> the clumsier we are. I'll read the credits for the film, and then we'll get to the discussion. And I'll apologize in advance for the names we're going to get, we're going to pronounce totally wrong. I'm feeling brave. I believe in you, buddy. So, Old Boy was directed by Park Chan Wook. It was produced by Lim Seung Yong. Screenplay was by Huang Jo Yun, Lim Jun Hyung, and Park Chan Wook. It was based on Old Boy by Geron Suchia and Nobuaki Minigishi. It starred Choi Min Sik, Yuji Tai, and Kang Hye Jung. Music was by Cho Young Wook. Cinematography was by Chung Chung Hoon. Edited by Kim Sang Bum. Distributed by Show East and was released on the 21st of November, 2003. The film is kind of legendary. It's generally well received by cinephiles and critics the world over. It's won like a metric shit ton of international awards and is generally considered one of the finest revenge films ever made. It was remade eventually in North America. And most people don't really know that it's part of a revenge trilogy of Park Chan-wook's. Thematically, not... Thematically, yeah. not actually, like, storyline-wise. But not many people know about Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance and... Lady Vengeance? Lady Vengeance. Vengeance which were less inspired names. <laughs> <laughs> the film Old Boy also appears on BFI's Sight and Sound, Greatest Films of All Time, 2012, 588th on the Critics' Poll, and 546th on the Directors' Poll. So two critics voted for the film and one director. None of which are names I recognize. Which is most often the case, to be honest. Most often the case. 
So this was my first time watching the movie. Dustin, you've seen it a couple of times prior to this. I've probably seen it about four or five times already, and the North American remake, and I did read the manga. You are fully informed. (laughs) You are prepared. Uh, Give us a quick summary of the movie and uh, what you thought of Old Boy. The premise of Old Boy is that Mr. Odaisu is drunk and belligerent one night in a scene I consider quite hilarious. And when his buddy goes to bail him out of jail, he just disappears. He spends the next 15 years stuck in a single room until one day he just suddenly wakes up in a briefcase with a bunch of money. <laughs> I think I think briefcase is a... No, no, not a briefcase, sorry. It's like a footlocker. <laughs> he wakes up in a piece of luggage with a bunch of money on a rooftop by somebody who was about to commit suicide and I guess didn't notice the luggage there. Either way, from there, his goal is to figure out what the hell happened and why. That takes him going all over his past and we learned that he's basically a giant turd, yet somehow his being a turd isn't the reason he's in there. But we'll get to that later. His whole quest is to discover why he was locked up for 15 years and why he was released after 15 years. Because he figures out, or he finds the person who does it, who insists that he figures out why. (laughs) (laughs) I actually first saw this film, I think in 2004. My older brother had seen it. And uh, last I heard, it's his favorite movie of all time. I, for one, loved the ridiculousness of the movie when I first saw it, and I still enjoy it. Watching it this last time, one thing I sort of recognize is that a lot of the things people are doing, in particular Odaisu and Mido, they don't necessarily make sense in their actions. It's kind of ridiculous. A lot of the stuff they do, it's like, why the heck are you putting up with this guy who tried to rape you? But it's the hypnotism. Exactly. At the end, when you learned that they were sort of hypnotized and had a lot of post-hypnotic suggestion, as long as you buy into that conceit, their actions make some sort of sense. Whenever it comes to anything very strange that they do, in particular with how they're acting towards each other, it's all because that was just sort of created for them by Wu Jin. Like Wu Jin, his actions make sense if you just take him on as being a crazy guy, which he quite frankly is. (laughs) He spent his entire life setting up this, this revenge. And it's the only thing that gives him a reason to breathe, as evidenced by the fact that he decides to stop doing that once it's over. (laughs) Because Odaisu witnessed something that got around, which led to his sister. This is where it gets really ridiculous, actually. When it comes to the endings, there's three endings. If you look at uh, the original manga, you look at this film, and you look at the North American remake... All three have different endings, and honestly, the Japanese one is the most ridiculous to an extent. (laughs) Both film versions, it's about incest. It's Wu Jin and his sister, and a rumor gets out. He doesn't even know who Wu Jin is at this point. There's just a rumor that his sister was sleeping around with somebody else, and this leads her to kill herself, and Wu Jin loses his goddamn mind. In the North American remake, it involves the whole family, and... The dad goes to kill everyone, Wu Jin's the only survivor, and then loses his mind. In the manga, it's all because Wu Jin was so unpopular and felt like he had no one. He just sort of reveled in his, I'm beneath everyone, and it just became part of his identity. And so when he sung a song with every bit of his emotion one day for class, and the only person who wasn't laughing at him, was Odaisu, who was actually crying because he understood the loneliness that he injected into his song. He was like, the top is just as lonely as the bottom. Fuck you, Odaisu. I'm going to torture you for no good reason. (laughs) It's, It's absolutely absurd. But of course, it is, it's very interesting that they make it a different sort of mystery to be solved in every one. And it plays out very differently, at the very least, in the manga compared to this one the way you're describing sort of the three endings and the the level of absurdity and how we kind of preface that by talking about how the post-hypnotic suggestions actually served to make some of the more absurd behavior make sense 
to a certain degree. It kind of sums up a lot of my attitude towards this movie because it would go in really weird places and it would do something really crazy and then it would ground itself hard and fast. And it would be like, whoa, okay. It did that high peak and then it came down and that's, it's basically like a, it's like a cinematic suplex. <laughs> <laughs> but then after you hit the mat, they do something crazy bonkers again to build off of what they've just sort of revealed. Like, you find out, oh, Wu Jin and Su A were brother and sister, and Odai Su saw them getting, getting it the on. Second base. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the rumor that started. And, like, that alone is a satisfactory enough foundation for Wu Jin to, to create his absurd, lifelong obsession with making Odai Su pay because his sister died as a result there was a suicide or at least we think it's a suicide up to this point but then you find out she had a phantom pregnancy she had a hysterical pregnancy which didn't exist and the idea that people would think that not only did she have sex with her brother but she's well they didn't even know that it was her brother that she was having sex with the rumor was just that she was sleeping around with everybody as was told did by she his have friend. some sort of shame about if this would be their child and everybody would like hate it or something Anyways, they do this, like, just the whole hysterical pregnancy thing is is bonkers. It's it's a bonkers addition to something that was already kind of absurd, but absurd within sort of the, the context of the logic of the film. And so many times throughout the film, it's just, it's what Park Chan-wook does with the narrative and the viewer. Every time this movie had me on board... It was like, it would lose me, and then it would just pull me right back in, and then it would just let me off the bridge like Wu Jin <laughs> dropping Sua off the dam. He didn't drop her, <laughs> she let go. <laughs> well, she was insisting to be let go. And she did. She did. But I enjoyed, like, as a sort of a villain, I love how much pleasure he got from all of this, and you could tell he didn't care about anything else. When his bodyguard is fighting Odai Su at the end and eventually gets an ice pick to the ear and he might end up killing Odai Su. He's like, hell no. Shoots his bodyguard and lifelong friend. It's like, nope, this is not what we're here for. This is not what I'm here for and this is what matters. But Odai Su, he does whatever it takes at the end there. <laughs> and he's just losing his mind. But so many of his actions are very much bonkers. It's really well staged, it's really well acted, and it's really well executed. I think where you really see that up and down is very early on in the film. Him in the police station, it's very grounded. This is a drunk guy being an asshole, and as, as I said, hilarious scene to me. I love that scene, he's great in it. But then you have him on the rooftop, and you've got the music, it's swelling, you've got the crazy camera angles, you've got the guy trying to commit suicide holding the puppy, and every th and he's talking about telling his story. He doesn't give a shit about this guy on the roof who eventually falls to his death anyway because he just walks off afterwards. <laughs> I understand. I hear your story. That's crazy. <laughs> now I'm going to tell you mine. Odaisu, he's gone. <laughs> but those were all things that I actually really enjoyed about the movie. Oh, yeah. There's your ups and downs right there. It doesn't hold out on you. <laughs> like, I was really surprised. I've heard so much about this movie being so violent and so brutal, and so, you know, kind of like the first John Wick. <laughs> just intense, and driving, and just revenge-focused, and that it's not for the squeamish, and you've never seen anything like this, at least back in 2003. And to find out just how funny this movie is, <laughs> which sort of came as a surprise because of my preconceived notions about the film, but wasn't much of a surprise since I had even just recently seen Parasite, and I'm getting the, the impression that there might be a weird sense of humor in a lot of Korean film. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen a lot of Korean film. Basically, uh, The Host? Yeah, I've seen The Host. I've seen Parasite. I've seen Snowpiercer. I've seen uh, Tale of Two Sisters. And I've seen Old Boy Now. But they all have a weird sense of humor to them. None of those films are just straight into the genre that they are. So I don't know any more about it, but I'm kind of 
operating on that premise. <laughs> uh, so yeah, anyways, there was a there was a kinship there, and it, it was like I kind of embraced it. I was like, okay, this is what the movie actually is, and it was kind of fun. And watching the craziness and the like, just what a weird bastard he is through most of the movie, and the way he interacts with other people. Like you said, when he walks away from the guy committing suicide, or how he treats Mido, or even how he treats his friend Juwan, he's just so driven. And I mean, it, it kind of makes sense too, because he was already kind of a dick. But he's been locked in a room for 15 years, and like his social graces, <laughs> they're just gone. Like he doesn't have time for it, he doesn't have the desire for it, he's just... He doesn't know how to talk to people. No. He didn't know how to talk to people at the best of times. <laughs> Like and when he gets out of the luggage, he's just like touching the guy, the su- touching the face of the suicidal guy, like he's a blind person. <laughs> You're wondering if he's going to lick him. <laughs> and once I picked up on the rhythms of the bizarreness of the movie, I really dug it, and I was following the ups and downs. But then there's probably I'm going to guess about three moments. I, I, it's been a while since we actually saw the movie, so I can't quite pinpoint it. I know that one of them is a hysterical pregnancy. I think one of them was the begging scene, where he. He tells Wu Jin that he'll basically like be his dog to not tell Mido. And it just goes on and on and on and on. I will say, though, the Mido reveal that he was her father, it was insidiously brilliant. It was incredibly well executed. It makes my head buzz to this day just to talk about it because of the way it was revealed. That was something that, especially since they tricked you early on into being like, oh, she's dead. He's like, no, I faked all that shit. And you're like, this guy's rich and crazy. This is exactly the kind of thing he would do. There's no, that's a deus ex. That was just out of the blue. It made perfect sense. (laughs) They could have dropped the ball with that. They could have gone to some weird, like, bonkers level. And instead, what they did was they went to the hypnotist at the end. And he hypnotized himself to forget. Which is just kind of, like, weird and fucking creepy, as it is. But it also kind of makes sense sort of within the movie it's this weird twisted logic so i'm really happy that he he stuck the landing there (laughs) considering how he literally dropped me out of the movie about three times i mean that's that's the important thing right like that landing the ending if a movie doesn't have a good ending doesn't matter how good the first 110 minutes of the movie are the ending can make or break it it can i last sixth sense (laughs) and it was it was totally really interesting and it was really dramatic. It's well written, and it leaves you on like a really interesting. It leaves you in a really interesting mental place. Because now you're wondering, is that a good ending or not? Because he's basically saying, "Yeah, I'm just going to end up hooking up with my daughter. It's all good. No worries. Don't even worry about it." Also, I cut off my tongue, and I'm probably not going to remember why. <laughs> <laughs> tongue was kind of extreme too but you it kind of makes sense he doesn't want his daughter it's this weird situation where he's kind of sacrificing himself to be Mido's love who she loves because she doesn't know he's her father he's basically killing himself with this hypnotism and it will crush her it will destroy her to know so he's going to continue with the facade and he's going to use the hypnotist to hypnotize him to hopefully keep the dragon at bay and to to be Mido's to see sugar where it daddy goes. <laughs> <laughs> and see where it goes. Yeah, I mean... He's going to have a fun time trying to get a job, though. <laughs> it's dark and weird and twisted and, like, weirdly romantic and haunting and troubling and well, it, the it romance, all makes sense. The romance itself was set up via post-hypnotism. Yeah. Like, even the way they were going to hook up initially, like, it's... It's still creepy. She's like, I'm not ready yet. When he tries to assault her that first time on the bathroom, on the toilet with a knife, the door doesn't lock. (laughs) I've got a knife, so just don't come in here, okay? And she comes back like, oh, no, 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 I wasn't ready. But when I am ready, I'll sing this song. And she does. And watching that, especially the first time, I was like, that's the stupidest fucking thing I've ever heard. That is bonkers nonsense. But then when he reveals, yeah, I set that up with post-hypnotic suggestion, as long as you're buying into that conceit once again, then you're like, okay, now I can get behind that because that's not romantic. That's just him playing a game. That's Wu Jin messing with these people. It's not necessarily romantic, but certainly at the end, Odai Su, he's like, this is what she has. 
this is what my daughter has. The best I can do is give it to her or take it away. What is best? Yeah. I love how you keep saying, you know, as long as you buy into that. I have issues with hypnotism. Well, no, <laughs> it's a conceit. Every time you say it, it, it kind of like strikes a chord with me. And the last time you said it, I thought, yeah, if you're willing to buy into like face off level plot contrivances. <laughs> <laughs> Where one guy can cut his face off and put his face on another person. Like, if you're willing to buy into that sort of stuff, like this movie, it's tight. <laughs> and that's the thing that I'll always talk about in, in a film or a game. Give me the world. Have your own internal logic that's internally consistent. And this film is internally consistent. And it also has some very grounded, very realistic things going on. I do love that long shot fight scene which is a very famous scene of the film and the most brutal thing other than possibly the uh, hammer dentistry which isn't as bad as it sounds but I love how tired they are during that fight like he's swinging around the hammer they're fighting, they're panting everyone takes a break sometimes they're like just leaning on the wall breathing heavily I can't not think of Wes Anderson when I see that (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's just like a fixed shot. It's like they're <laughs> fighting in a diorama in that hallway. It, it's literally like a side-scrolling video game. Oh, 100%. I've played that video game 50 <laughs> times before. <laughs> but they're all so tired, and fights don't last that long, and you get super tired afterwards. Then, after that whole realistic enough fighting scene, he opens up, or the elevator comes down, and there's like 20 more guys there, and then it's just the elevator opens up and they all fall down. He's on the front level and walks away. So you have that grounded scene followed by something utterly ridiculous. <laughs> that actually points out something that I wanted to discuss, which is the editing of the movie, which I think is actually fucking brilliant. Oh, 100%. Because <laughs> he knows when to sit in a moment. He knows when to cut from a moment. Uh, there's the elevator scene. You've just been through this protracted side-scrolling video game fight. And then here's another 10 guys in an elevator. Unlike John Wick 2 or 3, (laughs) are we going to watch this fight? No. We're just just going to have a joke ending. (laughs) Yeah. And it's the same with when he walks into the the hair parlor. The, the, The friend of his from high school who he's getting some information from. He doesn't... Hair parlor? You mean the video game? No, right? The hair... No. The hair salon. Yeah, yeah. He, there's the salon, yeah. With the girls. He, he goes in there, and instead of having all of this exposition and him explaining the movie up to this point, they literally just cut from... He walks in, and it's like, oh, hey, you. And then they cut to them sitting in the chair. And the movie is full of those, you know, long, really dwelling on a moment shots and just skipping bits. We were talking about skipping bits with Wong Kar Wai, actually, in the last episode, how he just jumps through time. And I really also like how Park Chan-wook plays with time. Although he definitely skips far fewer bits. Oh, yeah, for sure. (laughs) He chooses his moments, like, a lot more... Judiciously? (laughs) Yeah. And, I mean, the story wouldn't have made any sense (laughs) otherwise. Like, it takes place over the course of five days a week, something short like that. Yeah, it's not that long. It's a different amount of time in each film as well. I haven't seen the North American one in a while, but... Because he basically tells him in the car. He says you have this long to like find three out. days. Yeah. I loved when they were looking for that uh, dumpling, and he's eaten like one dumpling and leaving, eating one dumpling and leaving. Oh, vomiting. trying to figure out where the dumplings were made that he got fed when he was in the room for 15 years. Yeah how he eats too much of them and he throws up (laughs) he eventually (laughs) finds the delivery guy and is just chasing him down the street those are your like it's a very comedic editing you have the guy going by on the moped and then there's Odaisu running up the hill (laughs) gets into the elevator right afterwards and just completely out of breath just looks at the delivery guy tell him he uses too much salt in his dumplings (laughs) (laughs) oh sure (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that one kind of threw me when it when it came on because that was not how I expected they were going to track down <laughs> but I thought it was brilliant there's there's so many little bits of like narrative brilliance in this movie and, and it's 
actually a pretty brave movie, but I do think it's kind of imbalanced. Namely the places where it lost you? <laughs> Namely the places where it lost me. One thing I gotta say was uh, pretty entertaining was the acting of Choi Min Sik. From what I remember reading back in the day, he's actually a devout Buddhist at the time of the film, and when he's eating the live octopus, like he's normally a complete vegan, and they did the scene twice, but he is devoted enough to his craft that he just did it anyway. <laughs> And I mean, I'd I'd have a hard time doing that. You could see the thing fighting its way out of his mouth. It's it's an interesting scene. (laughs) And you have the scenes with him and his crazy staring face. (laughs) He's just, he goes so very nuts with it. And at the same time, he'll have some parts where he's fairly reasonable. He's, He's up and down. He featured in another film that you feel is too stupid not to love, which is Lucy. It's got some it's got some good in it. It really misses the mark, but I like the mark it was hitting or trying to hit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying Lucy's a quality <clears throat> film, I'm saying it's a quality adjacent idea. <laughs> I have opinions about that film. <laughs> so this movie is it's it's regarded by so many people. I've heard so many reviews and comments about it being like just extreme and it's really not that extreme. And it's I was, was going to ask bloody. you, like, it's not that violent. How you felt about that? Because I've seen extreme films. This has very the long fight scene doesn't have much blood at all. It's it's shot from very far away <laughs> or choreography <laughs> or choreography. <laughs> That's one of the things that I felt made it so feel so grounded and brutal. Is it was a lot of flailing. A lot of flailing. You'd even have people just like flailing at the air, like, ah, get away from me! I don't want to get too close. And people that, on the ground who are just like great. slapping at legs. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that was really bloody, since they don't really show you the tongue other than him putting the uh, the tin snips around it, is him tearing off the tooth of uh, the guy who owns the building he was imprisoned in. And there they show the tooth, they show the hammer sort of grabbing onto it, and the tongue's trying to push away the hammer. A little bit of blood comes out, and then they move away. And you don't even see it pop out. So that's the goriest thing in the film. And honestly, you see worse on daytime TV nowadays. So it's really hard to think of it as an extreme film. Unless they're talking about, it's got incest. Do you think the reaction is because that was 15 years ago? Do you think the reaction is the insinuation of it? Or do you think we're just reading... The, the balance of the comedy with the extreme bits, it, it kind of leavens? I think it's the incest that gets it. You think people are just coming out feeling really uncomfortable? Yeah, because even 15 years ago, there'd be things that are this violent or as violent. But when it comes to... I thought you were going to say that incest is so much more normalized 15 years later. <laughs> Honestly, it is. Incest porn is the most rise, or the most popular... In Canada? It's gaining popularity worldwide. It's all over the place. Granted, that's mostly the step family stuff, but still, it's the most rising thing. And I'm, I have theories as to why that is, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Fifteen years ago, that's, the idea that's of a incest. whole different podcast that we will <laughs> we will start up in 2020. <laughs> but the notion of brother sleeping with sister and father sleeping with daughter, and it's not treated as it's not treated like a crime. It's treated like here's a here's a thing that happened and it's not necessarily bad, it's not necessarily good. It's it's just a thing. It's almost normalized in sort of the extreme way that this film has everything, but it might just be that which made it so extreme to people. I can honestly say I didn't think the conversation would go this direction when I brought that up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that will teach you, sir. <laughs> it's almost like you've never met me. <laughs> I don't disagree with you. I I don't. I just assumed it was the comedy because it is it's like a Buster Keaton slapstick goofball comedy mixed with some John Wick and some Quentin Tarantino and some Sam Peckinpah. <laughs> <laughs> and I just assumed because, you know, I was made uncomfortable by some of the insinuated things, the the incest and, and some of the violence. You know, they weren't pleasant to watch. And I think that's a tribute to the filmmakers that you're not so numb to it that when it does happen, 
you do feel the emotions that are supposed to be <laughs> attributed to dude i've been so jaded for so long that yeah i don't feel nothing when it comes to this it's like this this might as well be a child's cartoon to me. <laughs> <laughs> i've seen too much <laughs> Which is a great place to plug Dustin's in case you were considering a series <laughs> of minisodes where he watches some of the worst movies ever made, so you don't have to. Depending on who you're talking to, because there are definitely those in the comments who have disagreed with me. There are. There are. Uh, I'm, I'm struggling, dude. Like, I feel like there should be more to talk about this movie, and I feel like, I feel like we're, we're dropping the ball because we don't have more conversation here, but I kind of feel like we've covered... Well, as you said, the editing's great. The sound direction in, com- in combination with the editing is great. The acting is good. It's overdone in certain places, but it's meant to be. Or at the very least, it's strange. But whatever they're doing, you believe that character is that character. Especially when you learn about the, the post-hypnotic suggestion. At the end of the day, it's a fun film. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. It's, it takes you for a ride. And you might not remember all the ups and downs of this roller coaster, but at the end, you're feeling something. That's true. That is actually a pretty good way to describe it. I think that's a better way to describe it than all of the really like intense vengeance porn, hardcore, this is the most everything film you'll ever see. It's a ride. It really is an amusement <laughs> park ride. It's got the ups and downs. It's got the, it's got the tunnel of love. It's got the hall of mirrors. It's got it's the whole schlemiel. Chat, naawasseumida. Sango matjo? Ije jalladu delkaeyo? Alright, well I guess we'll we'll cap it off there then. So the question is, going into the judgment section, does this roller coaster ride of a film get it on the list of greatest films. One of the interesting things about this movie for me is we didn't get around to recording soon after watching it. And as we were watching it, I knew it was going to be a museum piece. Even if it was going to stick the landing, the movie just dropped me too many times. And then over time, it like the myth of the movie, the story of the movie in my head there was a fondness and a nostalgia and, a, and just kind of like digging on the things that the movie was doing. And I definitely have much warmer, fuzzier feelings for the movie now than I did immediately after watching it, which created conflict for me because I wasn't sure like how I was going to vote now because now I kind of feel a lot better about the movie than previously. But then I also thought the mission statement of the podcast is to try and cut through the nostalgia because some of the greatest movies of all time are considered the greatest movies of all time simply because people remember them as being the first or, you know, they were young and they watched it and it tickled their fancy and, you know, you can't change their mind now. But those movies maybe aren't objectively the greatest films of all time. So it kind of brought me around... This is long story long, I guess. <laughs> it brought me back around full circle where I think I'm going to go museum piece. And I may regret it, and I may hear about it in the comments. <laughs> but I'm going to go museum piece because as much as I like this movie, as entertaining as this movie is, as fun as it could be, as impactful as it could be. Because even just talking about some of the really you know darker, more twisted elements of it still 
I've got heebie-jeebies while talking about it. I don't think the movie, because it hits those crazy, absurd highs, and it takes me out of the movie repeatedly, I can't give it a masterpiece. Well, in order to save face for the podcast, I actually was coming into this not knowing where I'd land, and after talking about it and remembering the sound and the editing that was done so spectacularly, I'm falling over to the masterpiece side. It is a roller coaster ride of a film, and that's sort of the point of it. When it comes to a lot of the nostalgia, if after just a week or two, you're starting to really have fond memories of it, the question is, would you go back and revisit it? Lord knows, after I've seen it, it, it didn't take me long to say that it was a, a very fun or an awesome movie. And I've gone back and I've revisited it and I've shown other people the film and I looked up the other stuff around it. And it's a movie that sticks in my head and that has nothing but sort of warm, fuzzy feelings. And when it comes to comedies, when it comes to actions, it's often the one that sticks out that is the one that has that potential to be long-lasting, to be that classic, to be that masterpiece. This one has enough technical achievements compared to a lot of the other action films or comedy films that you might see that it has that going for it but it's not forgettable and it's something that can make you think and I do honestly to this day as I'm watching it wonder to myself was the brother sister incest really that wrong did Odai Su make the right decision at the end so it even has a little bit of depth going on amidst the weird shallow nonsense <laughs> I'm actually glad that you went masterpiece. I would feel, I would have felt bad <laughs> if we didn't have a split decision on this cuz I even was talking to you before we recorded, you know, I was looking for kind of reviews. I was basically seeking a confirmation bias and I found lukewarm reviews of the film who weren't as amazed by it as so much of the rest of the world is and I was like, "Oh great." What do they have to say about it? And I disagreed with everything they were lukewarm about. <laughs> so, you know, I'm feeling lukewarm, but about different things, which is ultimately why I still went with the museum piece. But because I'm so torn, I'm glad you, <laughs> you at least carried the banner for the film. And I will. And I'll possibly even revisit the other two versions of it. And I would definitely revisit this. Not not right away, but... I know you were saying you were interested in seeing what uh, Spike Lee did with it. I'm really fascinated to see what Spike Lee does with this material because it's so far away from anything that I sort of associate with Spike Lee. My spoiler for that is it does feel Americanized. <laughs> and it's not just because they're talking English. Funny as it might be, when I remember a film that's or a show that it's in a language other than English, I remember the subtitles and I remember people speaking the subtitles. I remember it in English. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it for our discussion on Park Chan Wook's 2003 Old Boy. It's one yay and one nay for masterpiece versus museum piece. Let us know what you guys think in the comments. And speaking of comments, to go with our sort of new format of uh, mentioning comments that get left for us either in emails or on the YouTube comment section or Facebook or whatever. Uh, Dustin and I each pick one comment and mention it on the show. And I'm going to mention PRM68 comments uh, in regards to our Full Metal Jacket episode that I'm from the UK, so I'm no expert on this, but I do know the training was reduced to eight weeks. So the drill instructors were under great pressure to prepare the recruits for war. This is what the boot camp part of the film is portraying. That episode was from a while ago. I'm guessing Dustin and I might have wondered about the drill sergeant being such a hard ass. Uh, but that makes sense. Uh, during the Vietnam War, they just wanted to get boots on the ground as soon as possible. So thanks for that comment and that clarification. And somebody else trying to uh, inform us of something going on in a film was Owen Johnston talking about how the Forbidden Room thing was a reference to something else in Japan, and just him mentioning it sort of reminds me of hearing something similar in the game Fatal Frame 2, unless that's a constructed memory that I just made up, but now I'm wondering. I'm putting it out there. <laughs> Does anybody know about the Forbidden Room and what it means? I think you and Billy were talking about 
believing that that was part of something greater in Japanese culture and Japanese horror culture or something and in my mind a version of their creepy pasta I guess <laughs> Uh, and I don't think you or Billy could remember, but you both felt that it was something. But facts don't care about our feelings, Mike. No. <laughs> no, they don't. But he said he's going to try to look it up for us and let us know. So if you figure it out, Owen, by all means. <laughs> so that's our two shout-outs for the episode. Um, and that pretty much brings a close to the episode. We've got two things on the burner right now. Dustin and I, were going to try and catch a, a local screening of Color Out of Space, which is the uh, Richard Stanley Lovecraftian existential horror starring uh, Nicolas Cage movie that's that's coming out. We're kind of looking forward to that and hoping to do a quick considerations episode on that. And we also have our aforementioned anniversary episode coming up, which we're still sort of trying to figure out the nuts and bolts of it. We might be doing a film as per kind of our regular scheduled programming with just some extra anniversary talk kind of around it or it might just be a full sort of discussion of the show revisiting some of the old films that we might have had second thoughts on talking about some of the comments or activity on those films kind of a a look back a state of the union we're not 100 percent sure what it's going to be if we are doing a movie I'm thinking it might be broadcast news, though. So if you've got any questions or things you want us to look at at broadcast news, should you be familiar with the film, let us know, and we will try to give that some special consideration as we make our review later on. And that is something we will probably expand on a little bit as we talk about sort of what we want to do with the show moving into 2020 on the anniversary show. So, yeah. Thank you guys so much for checking us out, for being so patient, uh, for downloading, for letting people know about us. Uh, be sure to come back next time to hear Dustin and me jibber jabber about movies I'm trying to remember a good Mr. T quote with jibber jabber but I just cannot and I feel like my impression of him would just be terrible <laughs> <laughs> so take care you guys we'll see you next time on For Your Consideration we're out of here I've been your host Mike and I've been your other host Dustin take care peace So we are checking out Park Chan Wook's 2003 Old Boy, which probably you should have said so I could come up with the uh, summary. <laughs> I was, <laughs> I was waiting to see how far it would go. <laughs> Let's go for it. <laughs>